Here are two authentic fragments. The left one is 6.5 millimeters. This is an x-ray that I performed on an authentic human skull that I purchased. On that skull, I placed a cross-section of a 6.5 millimeter manicure carcano bullet. And this is what it should like if it were actually that size. That's not what you see on the right image of JFK. This metal fragment is authentic, but it's very, very small in comparison. So I performed an experiment in the lab, but first I took very detailed optical density measurements at the National Archives. I measured the transmission of light through selected points of JFK's x-rays, took not dozens, but hundreds, at least hundreds of measurements there. So the measurements in particular here were taken from JFK's lateral skull x-ray. Uh, the the x-rays shown here are my experimental ones. This, how, this is how a 6.5 millimeter cross-section should look on the anterior posterior x-ray, and this is how it should look on the lateral x-ray. Uh, but of course, we don't see on JFK's lateral x-ray anything like that. So I took measurements uh, right through those images on JFK's X-ray shown in the lower graph here with the solid data points. And you can see as we traverse through the metal fragment on the lateral X-ray, there's only a very slight change in optical density because this thing is so small. But on the experimental one, the one that I produced here, there's a big change in optical density, and that's consistent with, with what you see with your naked eye. So in other words, these two graphs are totally inconsistent with each other. I should emphasize that I took 10 data points per millimeter. So this was a fairly tedious and a, a tedious measurement and took a precise localization of uh, each successive data point. All of my JFK data were taken at the archives from the extant x-rays. My peer-reviewed article can be found online by simply typing JFK 6.5 saga. Greg Henkelman, MD, was a physics major and is now a radiation oncologist in practice for 30 plus years. Uh, Greg saw my optical density data and he wrote this review on Amazon. Dr. Mantic's optical density analysis is the single most important piece of scientific evidence in the JFK assassination. Unlike other evidence, optical density data are as theory-free as possible, as this data deals only with physical measurements. To reject alteration of the JFK skull x-rays is to reject basic physics and radiology. Dr. Mantic has a PhD in physics and has practiced radiation oncology for nearly 40 years. He is thus eminently qualified in both physics and radiology. And here the magic rabbit appears. The 6.5 millimeter object pops up. Well, I was at the archives. <clears throat> I looked very closely inside the borders of this object. And on the next slide, you will see my drawing of what I saw. So here's the 6.5 millimeter object, obviously greatly magnified. On your left, I saw a, an authentic a piece of metal with the sizes as shown. The borders lined up really well with the 6.5 millimeter object, but I saw something really inexplicable as well. I saw a piece of metal, this tiny piece of metal shown with a red arrow, right in the middle of nothing. But this is inside the 6.5 millimeter object. This is a double exposure. You can read about double exposures in Fielding's uh, textbook, Special Effects Cinematography, and here's an image from that book. The 6.5 millimeter object is a result of a double exposure in the dark room. Why could I see a double exposure that no other radiologist could see? Ironically, because I was nearly blind. 
high myopia is like wearing a low power microscope. Here's my prescription uh, in 1982 showing my minus 8.75 diopters in one eye and minus seven in the other. High my myopia, that is minus five or worse, afflicts only 4% of the US population, you can look it up. But I had severe myopia, I wasn't minus five. One of my eyes was minus 8.75 and only about one out of 100 Americans is that bad. How many government radiologists had severe myopia? So having uh, recognized that this was a double exposure, I showed how easily it could have been done in 1963. Here's a bird brain, as I call it, a pteranodon inside the skull. And here's a scissors in black. And this was a double exposure, letting light through this shape. This was a double exposure blocking light from this shape. So I made this template, just cut out of this piece of cardboard, and I took a photograph through it to show you that it was really an opening. You can judge for yourself the size based on the key here. So compare the shape of my cutout here to the shape of the pteranodon. That's what I used. Larry Sturdivant was the HSCA expert in physics. And here's what he said about the 6.5 millimeter object in his book, JFK Myths. As radiologist David Nanty points out, there is no corresponding density on the lateral X-ray, end quote. Quote, the apparently metallic fragment was just as mysterious as when we went in to the archives. So this is his comment after examining the X-rays at the archives. In a previous email, uh, Larry had declared that this object could not represent an authentic metal fragment. He'd never seen a cross section of a bullet deposited on the back of a skull, and its other features were totally unworldly. Another paradox is the white patch, which magically appears. This is JFK's pre mortem x ray of 1960, just three years before he died. There's no white patch here, whereas it's clearly seen here in the print. I want to also uh, emphasize that the petrous bone is shown here. It surrounds the ear canal, and it is the densest bone in the human body. We will come back to that in a bit. But it's even worse than the absence of the white patch on the premortem x-ray. Given the white patch on the postmortem x-ray, there is no corresponding dense object anywhere on the frontal AP x-ray. If you see something that's that dense, that, that's so physically real on the lateral x-ray, goodness, you must be able to see the same object on a frontal view. Things don't just disappear because you move your x-ray machine around. In the real, real world, there must be something equally dense seen on the AP x-ray, but there isn't. There's nothing there. The first public account of this paradox was given at the New York City press conference on November 10th, 1993. So from the press conference in Manhattan, I made this statement, quote, such an extremely dense object should have been as visible as a T-Rex in downtown Manhattan that day. But there was no T-Rex. But we have data too. My conclusion was that the white patch looked almost as dense as that petrous bone. And the petrous bone was, of course, the densest bone in the human body. So if the white patch was almost as dense as the petrous bone, it would mean that JFK's skull was almost solid bone in the white patch from left to right. That would make him the first bonehead president. But we have actual numbers to work with. We compared the optical density of the petrous bone to the white patch or the parietal area. Uh, a number of one here would mean that the white patch was as dense as the petrous bone. It's not quite that, but it's close. You see the number is 0.89. So it's, the white patch is a little less dense than the petrous bone using all the measurements I took, which were quite a few. 
The same calculation on the pre-mortem x-ray, however, gives you quite a different number. The white patch is not there. It looks normal. So the number is 0.43. And then I looked at a lot of different patients on x-rays that I had in my clinic. And of course, they were about the same as JFK's pre-mortem. There's no human patient that's a bonehead all the way through the skull at that point. And JFK certainly was not. Here are the actual data. Uh, on, the, on your left is the pre-mortem x-ray, which was taken in August 1960. Um, Mike Chesser <coughs> traveled to the JFK Library in Boston and took this data in 2015. His numbers are in blue on this x-ray. On the right is the JFK post-mortem again. Um, my data from that uh, visit is shown in red, but uh, superimposed on the left image. We'll take a close look at that. Here's a magnified view. Here is the petrous bone again, surrounding the ear. And you can see my measurements in the white patch are 0 0.61, 0 0.610, 0 0.55, 0 0.64, which are not too different from the petrous bone at 0.55. Of course, I'm only showing you a few measurements here. There were lots more. So uh, from these numbers, we can say that these are almost the same. It's just a little less dense here. So the ratio is a little less than one. Now let's look at Chesser's numbers uh, taken from the pre-mortem uh, x-ray. And here you go, 0 0.64, 0 0.53, 0 0.54, 0 0.72, and so on. Uh, in other words, his numbers in this area are pretty close to what I measured on the post-mortem x-ray. But here's the critical point. In the Petrus bone area, his numbers are much different from the post-mortem, 0 0.3, 0 0.29, 0 0.28. In other words, the white patch does not exist. This is a normal set of numbers for the parietal area where the white patch is. And the ratio therefore is obviously very different. That the white patch was indeed not on the original x-rays is consistent with Humes's weird reaction to these x-rays during his AORB deposition. Quote, I don't understand why that is. You'd have to have some radiologist tell me about that. I can't make that out. I don't understand this great void there. I don't know what that's all about. How is it possible, end quote, I should say, how is it possible for Humes to react that way, that way when he'd already seen the x-rays? Well. It's because these are not exactly the x-rays he saw.